Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Bijou's daddy. Happy birthday to you. Take your alligator. It's time to get unbothered. Everything bothers him. He's unbothered. He calls it unbothered, but that's what's cute. Because everything bothers him. He's bothered. I'm a botherer. I'm a botherer now. What's up, everybody? Ty Rivera here, the absolute best LGBTQ comedian in the world. And welcome back to yet another episode. That's right. Another episode of Unbothered by Ty Rivera. Another one for the books. I don't know how many birthdays we've celebrated together, but I appreciate you guys for paying attention. I appreciate you guys for watching. And I appreciate those of you on the audio only. There are actually plenty of people listening on the audio only. I don't know why you choose to do that when I go out of my way to get dolled up like I have on this episode just playing. It was all like, <clears throat> Jesus. Well, we're going to leave that in because I don't feel like editing today. But it was all I could do to throw on this blouse that I hate. I mean, like the pockets off center. I hate this shirt. And I'm going to end up giving it to the Switch program, which if you aren't familiar... If you haven't heard me talk about the Switch program before, the Switch program is a program here in Las Vegas that they have at the center, the LGBT center, that provides clothing to LGBT youth, uh, trans specifically youth, because in a lot of cases, you know, trans kids aren't allowed or able to get the clothes that they want to get that coincide or affirm their gender from their families, their parents. So I do occasionally donate to them when I have some clothes I don't want. I should have a lot more clothes that I don't want to tell you the truth. I need to start being more honest with myself about that stuff because some, some of the things I have, it's like I'm never going to wear them. I don't know why I even still have them besides just being greedy because Really, there's no reason to hold on to things that you don't need. But I'm also getting better about that. Like I've told you guys, each time I go through my stuff, I get rid of more stuff. And I'm still working through that progress, uh, that process because I think I do have a little bit of pack rat tendencies. Well, not I think. I know I do. And I am getting better about that each time that I pare down again. And I've got to do another pairing session here soon. And so I'm going to go ahead and donate clothes to the Switch program, which if you're ever in Las Vegas or if you live in Las Vegas and you have some clothes that you want to get rid of, the Switch program would be the place to take them. I really didn't feel like getting ready today. And I'm not going to lie to you guys. I've had to check myself because I've been using the word exhausted lately. And it's like you're not exhausted. You're a little tired because you've had more stuff on your plate than you're used to, especially in the way of because, you know, I'll have plenty of stuff to do sometimes in the way of performing and traveling which in itself is a job. But when it comes down to this content creation that I've been doing lately, it really is more than I was expecting it to be. But at the same time, I'm very happy with the process. I just have to figure out how to delegate my time better because sometimes I will spend too long on social media, be it Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whichever one, Pornhub, uh, I may spend sometimes a little bit more time than I should on one of these platforms and or all of these platforms on some days. And I need to get better about that. And that's the reason that I also, you know, I have to fit in working out because I really do like being in shape. I like the way my body just feels from working out. I'm not even talking about the superficial just being in shape. Uh, I am talking about the... Uh, you know, actual, the way that I feel. I have a birthday coming up, which that's why I was singing happy birthday, happy birthday at the beginning, which to be clear, my co-host Snoopy Bijou is currently enjoying a Whimsy's alligator. She's fallen in love again. It's, it's like new, huh, Bij? Feels like the first time. She's going at it with that alligator. But she's been doing that the last couple of weeks, if you guys haven't noticed. Thank you, Cindy, again, for 
the Whimsies alligators. Bijou fell out of love with them for a while. But like I said, now she's fully back. This little girl is going at it when it comes to those alligators. And I'm happy to see that because I do like that they do keep her teeth clean. And then I clean her teeth myself. I don't take Bijou to the vet to get her teeth cleaned because uh, she's looking at me. She knows I'm talking about her. Uh, because I don't want anybody else handling her. I don't want anybody else hurting her. If I accidentally hurt her, which is rare now because I've been doing her teeth for the last eight going on nine years now it's very rare that I'll like nick her little gum or whatever with the scaler but when I do I give her a million kisses and she knows I'm her daddy and I would never do anything to hurt her so there's a lot of you know like I'm sorry I'm sorry I'm sorry kiss 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 and I know that in most cases they're not going to do that at the vet or at PetSmart so I just prefer handle everything here in-house Every once in a while, she bites my finger, but not in a rough way. She'll just bite it as like a clamp down or a bite stick. And, you know, I will have a little mark on my finger from her tooth afterwards sometimes. But I don't care about that. You know, I mean, like I'm big enough that she doesn't hurt me when she does it. And it's not done in a malicious way. But anyway, Whimsy's Alligators, the never to be sponsor of Unbothered by Tyra Vera. They don't give us a dollar. They don't give us a dime. They don't they don't even look our way when we see them out in the streets, when we see them at events. Whimsy's Alligators wouldn't spit on us if we were on fire, but we still put our Amazon affiliates link for Whimsy's Alligators down below in the description box. Carla's Homemade Salsa is on hiatus. I told, I warned you guys. You wanted to play stupid. All that time I was telling you, check out Carla's Homemade Salsa. And you guys were like, oh, it sounds so good. I see you eating it on your social media. And then what did you do? You, f you slept on it is what you did. I almost cursed, but... There's sensors. There's there's people I've got to watch out for. Uh, sometimes we got to remember we're in show business. I told Bijou earlier today because I think she was forgetting. She was whimpering and whining at me for her alligator. And I, like I told her, I reminded her that we're in show business. I was like, quiet on the set. It's not even about that right now. Quiet on the set. This is show business. This is the studio. Whether you like it or not, Bijou, you've been in show business your entire life. Do better. You think Britney Spears would act like this? Of course she would. She's out of her mind. And I don't care what anybody says. Freeing Britney Spears was the biggest mistake we've made as a country. Collectively. We were all involved. We're all... <laughs> we're all in some ways responsible and culpable for anything that Britney does. She shaves her head again. It's on us. That's on our heads. She decides to lock herself in the bathroom with her kids. Her kids are pretty old and they're probably going to whoop her ass. But that's on us too. Right now, uh, oh, one thing I want to talk about, Tasha K. If you guys aren't familiar with Tasha K, she's a blogger and or a vlogger, you know, and she does uh, unwind with Tasha K. And I didn't mispronounce unwind. It is unwind. You know, her thing was she was always pitching this wine and she loved to talk about Cardi B. She had this woman that was also an exotic dancer, an ex-exotic dancer that claimed to have been friends with Cardi B been roommates with Cardi B. I saw one of her interviews because it was like a two-part interview. And I got to tell you guys, with the exception of maybe like an Anna Nicole Smith, which I think we've heard everything we are, we're ever going to hear about Anna Nicole Smith, or maybe a Pamela Anderson, maybe if I were straight, I'd have a thing for blondes with big boobs. That's what we're putting together. But anyway, uh, with the exception of like those two, there are very few people that I would watch more than a one part, even a one part. I don't think I even made it through the first part. I think I watched part of it and then I was like, let me go mind my business and live like an adult and like I have things to do. So I went ahead and, you know, tuned out on that. But the thing with uh, Tasha... I almost said Tasha D. That's a comedian. Tasha K was she had been lying about Cardi B and she just recently lost a slander case against Cardi because Cardi was like, let me send this bitch a cease and desist. So she started with the cease and desist. And then Tasha K said something like, I think the quote was and don't quote me on this because people are getting sued now but I think the quote was allegedly <laughs> that she said I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing until the white people make me stop 
So, in other words, until something happens with the court, which is very similar to a situation that I had. Anyway, Cardi B ended up getting awarded uh, $4 million, close to $4 million. It was like $2 million for punitive damages, and then it was one point two seven, I think, or one point three seven that she had in legal costs because it's Cardi B. So of course she has to have the best representation, which I don't blame her at all. And technically that's what my thing is, because if you guys didn't know, there is a hate channel that's been dedicated to me. And I don't care if you hate me. I don't care if you talk about hating me until the cows come home. What I do care about is there have been several lies put out on that channel and there has been at least one paid gig that I've lost, but that paid gig wouldn't be worth me going to a full lawsuit, especially like the scale of lawsuit that I would have to go to. But if you think that I won't do that, and sometimes people think because maybe they have a couple extra dollars that that's going to shelter them. And really it's not when it comes down to provable. And I've like pulled clips. I re like screen recorded things. I have it all saved. So that's one of the things that I think people need to understand. And it's something I'm very careful, careful about on this podcast. Sometimes people think I just say things and I just talk, talk, talk. And that's what it is. I'm very careful about the things I say and not slandering anybody, not saying anything that's not true. That's why sometimes people act like I'm being shady because I have a bunch of receipts for the things that I say. And it's like, that's not about being shady. That's about being able to legally back up the things that I'm saying. Okay, if I said you said this then this is the proof if i said that you did xyz then here are the receipts for that that way i don't get in any trouble because one why would i want to get in trouble and two why should i get in trouble when all i'm doing is telling the truth and that's really one of the reasons the other day i'm gonna be honest about a year ago in june or a year and a half ago yeah so yeah june would have been a year ago or a year after I said that I was going to quit comedy. Uh, and I didn't, I still don't know why I said that. Like the truth was I'd smoked a joint and I said I was going <laughs> to quit comedy. And immediately after, because I posted it on Facebook and immediately after I posted it, I was like, why did you say that? And I still don't know exactly what possessed me to say that. Maybe I felt it on some level at the time. I think that's when we were all still somewhat in quarantine. So it's easy to say that stuff in quarantine. But like we're always in quarantine, you know, it's easy to say that stuff. in quarantine. But, it, but it is like quarantine showed us a lot about ourselves. That to me is true. And so uh, I, I thought that, you know, I don't know why I said that, but, and I didn't even feel it at the moment that I said it. It's not like right after I was like, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and quit. In my head, I was like, I don't know why I said that. So let me see if it turns out to be true. It turned out not to be true. I didn't quit. And so, and I had every reason to quit because it had been, you could say a rough year just in the way, like, I'll tell you what was rough about the last year for me. Having people say things about you that's not true will really bum you out. And there was something that happened in the Cardi B case where Cardi B talked about being suicidal after, uh, you know, some of the things were said about her that weren't true. And a lot of people were like, Cardi's just trying to milk it for that money. And as a person that that's happened to, I will tell you that you do, or at least I did, actually have suicidal thoughts because... At a point, you get like, well, why won't this person, A, just leave me alone, and B, why won't they just tell the truth or at least not lie about me, not go out of their way to lie about me? And it does get depressing. And like I said, there was one gig that it actually cost me, verifiable gig that it actually co cost me. And it's just like, well, what is this person trying to do right now? And the person even says on their podcast, on their videos, that they're trying to make me quit comedy. There's a point where they literally tell me to kill myself. And that should be against YouTube terms a service and I don't know how they were able to get away with that that really should fall under the bullying because you shouldn't be able to tell somebody and not you shouldn't be able to you're not supposed to be able to but that's what this person was doing and at a point you do get like okay well I don't know what like it really is just depressing it's literally depressing the the thing for me though is at a point 
I did just hit that threshold where it just got so much and it got so ridiculous that I was just like, I don't care about this. I don't care about this anymore. I'm just going to completely release this and let that person do what they do. Have your fun. I've already recorded enough stuff that when the time comes and I can really because like one of the things with me is once I do actually decide to take legal action on this situation, I just want to have the money to just say, let it ride to my legal team. That's what I want to say. And I'm not going to bullshit you guys and act like I have a legal team right now. I have a friend. Well, I have a couple of friends that are lawyers. I have one friend that's a really big lawyer. And so if I were to get high profile enough, I think I could get him to really, really cut me a break or help me out just for the fuck of it, really, just to ruin somebody's life. But it's not high visibility enough for him. Don't forget, I lived in L.A. for a long time, and there's a lot of people that are real fans of what I do. But it's just like this particular lawyer had me come into his office in Beverly Hills one time just because he wanted to actually meet me. Had seen me at the comedy store. We have a mutual friend. Mutual friend was like, hey, so-and-so wants to meet you. And there we went. And so I went and met him. He has this big, cute dog. And, you know, I was petting his dog and we're chatting about comedy. And he's talking to me about some of the more high profile things he's done, which if I were to even mention is he's so Googleable that it's not even funny it really is just the kind of thing where he's just a legit legit guy but you know money's money and business is business just like I'm not going to perform for him for free but if he were to offer a little trade-off I would perform for them for free him and his friends his whole law group I'll do your corporate party if you want to I'll be clean but you know He's got me beat on the per hour. He just does. So, uh, but, you know, I really do just want to be able to put together a team like Cardi put together and just be like, just pursue this. Just completely hunt this down because that person at a point did cause me enough grief. And like I said, did cost me money. So I really, and I know that they've done this to other people too. At one point, their hate channel was dedicated to somebody else. And they tried to disguise it as entertainment, which is something that Tasha K did. Tasha K was trying to dis- dis- uh, disguise it as um, entertainment. And, but she admitted that she knowingly said things that she knew weren't true. Then there was also her trying to play stupid at certain points. She was trying to give the, I don't understand the question. I don't understand the question. And the judge saw right through that. And that's something I think that's going to happen, start happening a lot more on YouTube. Like I said, I don't mind anything that I've said because I know that even when I've been angry, I've only said things that were factually true, things that I could back up. And especially when you consider that a lot of the things that I've said have been in response to things that people have said about me and who's a better expert on me than me. I know what I've done. I know what I haven't done. There was a point where that particular hate channel was saying that I was popping pills and I've never had a history with pill popping. It's just not something I do. I take supplements, which are just completely, you buy them through bodybuilding.com, HMB, uh, L-carnitin, uh, L-ornithine, and uh, what's the other one? It, it, but they're the same, you know, but like, it's I'm not a pill popper. I'm not doing prescription drugs. I've never done prescription drugs. If you guys know anything about me and my history, I've even talked about the fact that even when I've had plastic surgery done, which they prescribe you, uh, what's it called? Um, Percocet was what they prescribed me specifically because they had tried to give me Vicodin before, but Vicodin just wasn't a strong enough painkiller. But with when I've ever, ever had to have plastic surgery done, because, you know, when I had the silicone scraped out of my face, that was a process where they basically cut you open all right here rip your face apart from your skull basically and then do what they have to do it's like a a push with a scissor and then pull with uh with the tweezer which sounds really archaic but it was a really good doctor that i went to because i could have uh dealt with bell's palsy afterwards but i just had to have it removed and so you know like even at those times I hate being on pills so much because I just don't like the way they make me feel. So the thing I would do was I would take one as directed, you know, once the pain hit, 
after the surgery because you know when you first come out of that kind of surgery i'm going to tell you guys they will lie to you or maybe be colorful in the way that they talk to you about plastic surgery and i read online afterwards which i didn't know why i didn't read this before maybe god didn't want me to see it so i wouldn't back out because like i said i did literally have to have it done because the skin wasn't getting as much oxygen as it needed because there was so much silicone in there it was like a ball of silicone and i guess I could show that, but YouTube might demonetize this or cut down the, uh, the monetization just because, and so I don't really want to mess with that. Maybe I'll post it on my, my website in the not too distant future and let you guys see it there. But uh, you know, it, it, it was so painful and they'll lie to you and be like, you know, the recovery time is going to be like three weeks. It turned out to be everything that a doctor tells you. This is the rule of thumb I would give you. Everything that a doctor, a plastic surgeon, any doctor tells you when it comes to recovery time, always double that and count on that. So if they say you're going to have to be out of work for three weeks, make it six. Because with me, it was supposed to be, I believe, three weeks that I was supposed to be. And it ended up being closer to eight before I was able to actually go out in public. Like, yeah, could I have gone out in public after a couple of days because of the way that I felt physically? Yeah, I felt fine as far as that. And there was still residual pain, but it wasn't enough to keep you in bed or keep me in bed. You know, it wasn't crippling. But it looked so bad, like I had bruises and my face hadn't connected at all. And and I mean that literally, it looked like a mask. And so, you know, uh, it wasn't like it took me eight weeks to be able to be at least presentable and ended up catching a man on my first night out, though. But let's not talk about that. I was... There was like a party night, like not party because I wasn't drinking, but it was like a game night at a friend's house. And then the the following or that night when we were at the game night, some of the others were like, let's go to this particular bar tomorrow. I think it was Ice Picks was the name of the bar. They were like, let's go to Ice Picks tomorrow. And so I was like, okay, I'll go to Ice Picks. And, you know, I still was not comfortable being out in the world, but I figured if you don't get comfortable now, when are you going to be comfortable? And if you have this big crowd, because, you know, it was a pretty big crew that had come to the game night. The friend that I was hanging out with was pretty popular, and I'm from Arizona, and that's where I was for pretty much all of my recovery. And for quite a while after, I stayed a lot in Arizona during that year. I think that was 2013. I think that was 2013. And I spent a lot of time in Arizona just because recovering and taking care of myself and not being able to work the way that I was working before. I had to cancel gigs because, like I said, they told me that I was going to be ready in three weeks. And in three weeks, even my family was like, and my family is very supportive, but even they were like, yeah, you don't really look like you should be on stage right now. Like, it's just not going to go well. Like, they were worried that I was going to get traumatized. I told you guys I went out to the grocery store one day to go get raspberries because I was feeling fish. I was feeling cunt. I was feeling myself, girl. Oh, that's the way LGBT from my generation would talk sometimes. But, you know, it is what it is. But anyway, um, we're not allowed to talk that way anymore. Fish, cunt, not allowed to use those terms. But, you know, I mean, like in the way, I mean, I could get away with them on my channel because they're not curse words. They're not, uh, well, cunt, I guess, but not in the, anyway, uh, it's not a deal. It's not a thing. But you can't use those terms because they're considered derogatory towards women at this point, even though they were always meant from all the people I knew using those terms in the way that I just used them, they were meant as like the top of everything. The The best thing ever was fish and cunt. You know, that's the way that, because you have to remember that that's from the old trans talk. And so the transgender people, when I was coming up, which back then were referred to as transsexuals and even referred to themselves as transsexuals, were uh, the, being a woman, a genetic female, was the epitome of everything. You know, it's what you wanted to be. That's why, like, a lot of times I think genetic females 
kind of think they're competing with trans people in a way. And I guess maybe there are some trans people that see it that way. But the trans people I knew didn't have those struggles with genetic women, genetic females. They even used to refer them refer to them as genetic females or bio, biological females or bio females. And they didn't have those kind of problems because they wanted everything that a straight woman was. I mean, like the things that a lot of women don't like about themselves were everything that a lot of trans people I knew wanted to emulate. Like even when it came to cellulite, you always hear straight women complaining about cellulite, but all the trans women were like, yes, if I had cellulite, everybody would think I'm a real woman. You're supposed to have cellulite when you're a woman. And you know, like a uh, saggy breast or any of the things that you would think of or a lot of genetic females would think of as I should be ashamed of this. That's what trans people saw as, or the trans women I s hung out with saw as the most authentic. And so, you know, that there was, com it was compliments and I forgot where I was going with that, but I felt, I feel like that needs explaining because I think sometimes people take those terms wrong in now SJW culture and don't realize just like a lot of times the way that I will joke about trans people or if you were to ever see me with my trans friends, the way that they'll joke with me, we'll sometimes say the worst things to each other or what sound like the worst things to each other. And that's just because society always saw us all as freaks. So since I, since society saw us that way, we were like, well, we might as well take solace in each other. We might as well have fun. We might as well own it so we don't get our feelings hurt on the streets you know if we're already telling each other the worst things then why would we be hurt by people saying these things to us that we've already steeled ourselves towards you know it's just like it didn't make sense but um yeah what i was saying was i i really uh I forgot where I was going with all that, but it doesn't really matter. The The detours we take sometimes are better than the destination. That's really the way I feel about this podcast. And if you notice, a lot of times I will be able to pick it up and I'll be like, oh, yeah, that's what I was talking about. But sometimes I don't even care because I feel like whatever we talk about is just what we talk about. That's one of the reasons I appreciate this podcast and I appreciate all the people who listen to it. Like I told you guys, you know, last week when I did the episode where I was talking to the person who uh, read my cards or not talking to the person. I was playing the video of the card reading and I told you guys that there is only one person that you could ever say that I long for. Like other people, I definitely like them and I've definitely thought about them after our parting or breakup or whatever you would call it, uh, our conscious uncoupling. But whatever, it, whatever it's been, there's only one person that you could say I've actually longed for. And I was really thinking about that recently because I was thinking about the most recent thing I was in, which was December. And now when I think about that person, there's nothing there for me. Like I will hear because there was one particular song that used to remind me of that person when we were together. You know, when we were together, I used to think of that person like when I was driving home from Reno on that first week after that first week that we had spent together when I was working the Laugh Factory. I remember listening to that particular song because it made me think of him because he had put it on one of his Instagram stories. And I played this song over and over and over on my way home thinking about him. And because, like I said, I was really into him and, you know, vice versa. It was just it was mutual like that when we first started out. But then, you know, it, like now we've not been talking to each other for a month and probably a month and a half. Um, yeah, a month and a couple of weeks. And for me, it's just not a thing at all. It's like. I don't, I hear that song and it makes me dance because I like it, but it doesn't make me think about him. It doesn't make me in any way feel like I want to be back with him. Like really, I'm very happy, even though, like I said, I do have feelings and I'm even getting rid of those because that's the good thing about how busy I've been with creating the content and stuff like that. I really don't have time to think about a lot of people like yesterday may have seemed like a 
like I wasn't doing much on social media. I don't really know if that's the case, though, because yesterday was Tuesday. And if you didn't see what I was doing on social media, I put up 10 different uh, YouTube shorts, which I had to cut, you know, 10 different 30 to 60 seconds, second clips. So that took a while. Then there's also, uh, you know, the fact that I was recording or I had to edit my comedy tip Tuesday and then I had to go to the gym. I had to eat. I had so many things that I really had to do yesterday that I really didn't have time to think about or especially miss anybody. The only people that I was thinking about was the people that I actually have to deal with in some business way, you know, because there's always that. Like, that's the thing that's on top of everything. So there's the stuff that I'm choosing to do right now because I want to pivot more to creating and social media. And there's that. But then there's also like still the business stuff from the stand up side because I still have bookings coming up. I still have things that people are considering me for, which, like I said on another episode, uh, some of the stuff I'm being considered for right now, I don't really think a lot of people would associate me with because in a lot of cases it's clean, in some cases corporate clean, but I'm a true comic, so I'm willing to take the challenge if the money's right. If the money's not right, then I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it just for the fun of it in a lot of cases, but if the money is right and if it can, you know, get me even closer to where I want to be, because my main thing is just keeping everything funded so I can continue to create content because that's the direction I want to move in. And since I told you guys that that's what I was going to do, that's exactly what I've done. That's the reason right now I'm recording on, 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 that's the reason right now I'm recording unbothered is because there was part of me that felt super tired because yesterday was all that editing and uploading because there's the editing, there's the uploading, there's the coming up with the titles. Then, like I said, there's the having to walk Bijou, there's the having to make my food, there's all the stuff that I have to do that's just regular day-to-day stuff. Then there's dealing with emails. Then right now it's my birthday, so there's tracking packages from Amazon because people are sending me things or I'm, and now we don't have Amazon coming to our door anymore we're one of the apartment buildings that has a hub so you have to go to the actual amazon hub here in the building and if you don't get your stuff within three days they can clear it out which i don't know if they did because i haven't had anything stay in there that long but there's just a lot that's happening right now in a day and it makes it so i don't really have a lot of extra time left over and then like i told you guys there's also me wasting time sometimes which i'm getting better at but you know i'll be on instagram or whatever and so it like you know it's it's been good but it's taking figuring out and i really am confident though that this is the way that i want to go so when it comes to that kind of stuff I don't need to be with anybody right now, anybody at all, because I'm doing so many projects. Then there's some stuff that I'm working on that I just want to end up doing videos about, which one of them is involving castor oil, which sounds dirty, but it's not at all. It's completely wholesome. But there's that project. Then I still got to upload the video and record the video where I'm telling you guys about my booty progress. Because remember, I told you guys a while back that I was doing the 200 squats a day and I ended up changing that program out. Like, you know, I made modifications because that's one thing I'll tell you guys when it comes to working out. People are always asking me about working out. And one of the biggest things with working out is making modifications. And if there's a way to work smarter instead of work harder and still get the same benefits or close to the same benefits, then that's definitely what you should do because we're all living busy lives. We all have a million things to do. So you can do things the hard way because that's the way you've always been told they should, they should be done. Or you can actually just buck the system and say, you know what? I'm going to do this the way that is the most time efficient. And that's going to get me to my goal within the same amount of time, but just like free me up to do the things that I have to do. So I made modifications and one of them came from watching one of Kitty Pineapple's videos because, you know, Kitty Pineapple is an actual bodybuilder. And so when I see people and I'm like, okay, well, this is clearly producing results. And then I try it for myself and it does actually work for me. Then I'm going to do that. But there's, you know, there's the big part about that video is I'm going to tell you guys the truth. I'm a little vain and the fact that, and I'm not like, you know, 
crazy booty out of control now, but I am definitely very happy with my figure. Um, no, I'm very happy with the progress that I've made. Uh, be honest about that. And I won't mince words on it. And I think that that's important, too, when it comes to working out is congratulating yourself and letting yourself actually feel good about the things that you've done, giving yourself permission. When somebody compliments you or says something that looks good that you've been working on, say thank you. Don't make an excuse or talk about what it's not, you know, like my butt could definitely be bigger, you know, and I wouldn't mind it if it was. But if somebody tells me like. Like, you know, because I have had because, you know, I'm a gay man and I have gay friends and there's hookups that I have. And sometimes they'll say, you know, mm, booty's looking kind of cute. And I'll just be like, thanks, girl. Just plain. But that's the subtext, no matter what I say, because, you know, daddy vibes over here. Hmm. They ain't the only ones that are thirsty, apparently. But, um, yeah, so you got to learn to accept the the compliment, you know, instead of being like, oh, yeah, well, it's not where I want to be quite yet, but it's just say thank you. Just accept it, you know. Yes, I have been working hard. If you ever want to know what I do, I'll show you. But I am vain enough that I don't, I don't want to show my before picture because it was so gross it's such a flat ass but i'm gonna i'm gonna just buck up and do it even though i don't want to and this is the internet so i know somebody's gonna fucking yank it and use it against me but it, i'll be like what i had a flat ass guess what this isn't my original nose either these aren't my actual lips i mean there's a lot that's happened here so I, at least my booty transition was natural. I didn't, I wanted, well, that was the plan. I don't know if I ever told you guys about that part of the plan, but it was like, I'm going to try to make this booty just a little bit bigger. It doesn't have to be J-Lo. It doesn't have to be gay Lo. I just need it to be a little more perky. And I'll never forget one time my friend Melinda Ojeda told me, she was like, you may not be able to make it bigger, but you can definitely firm up and lift what you got. And she told me that years ago. And I, it always stuck with me, but at the same time, I was always like, mm -hmm, whatever, Melinda, you don't know my struggle. And then I really stuck to this program that I was doing. And like I said, made modifications, but still stuck to the whole general idea and what it was I was supposed to be doing, kept my eye on the prize. And it definitely did make an improvement. And I want to show you guys that. So I will make a video. It'll probably be like a five minute video. So it gets more views. Uh, just because I really would like to let some people see that, hey, you can do better than you're doing right now. And it wasn't that hard. And especially, like I said, wasn't as hard once I figured out, OK, maybe you don't have to do 200 squats a day. Maybe you can drop that down raise the weight a little bit, stay consistent with this because, you know, you can do 200 squats until you can't do 200 squats anymore. And then you burn yourself out and you're like, now I don't want to go back to the gym. Now I don't want to work out. But then you figure out a plan that works better and that's what you're going to do. And I know that I've gotten more tattoos lately. Excuse me. <laughs> Tired, not exhausted. Um, I've gotten more tattoos lately, which I know some people would think things about that, but that's the biggest thing about me right now that people have to understand is I really don't care what other people think about me. It's about whether or not I'm happy. It's about whether or not I'm actually doing the things that I want to do. Cause when it comes to like, you know, I got a septum piercing when it comes to piercing, when it comes to tattoos, all that stuff. All my life, I've been wanting tattoos and piercings. And there were different points where I had them. I had the snake bites at a point. But there were always times where I wasn't able to do it when I was younger. I remember one time, because, you know, when I was a young kid, I used to pick up jobs like that. Just, you know, I would quit jobs because I would get annoyed. Because one of the first jobs I ever had, like one of the first official jobs that I had was at a grocery store and I was so good to that grocery store just as far as doing things the way that I was supposed to my parents raised me that I was supposed to have a certain work ethic you're not supposed to call in unless it's a real emergency or a real 
sickness. And so that was the way I worked. And that job was so abusive with me that it made me never want to work like that again. And so I started a pattern where if people weren't good to me, which this isn't a bad pattern, and I see a lot of people doing it now, and people blame it on laziness, but it's like, no, just people have been getting treated like crap for minimum wage or less in some cases, you know, less than minimum wage under the table because they were raised like I was, like you're supposed to put up with this. And now these generations, these newer generations, younger generations have gotten like, yeah, I don't have to put up with people treating me like that. I can be treated like a human being. I should be paid at least a somewhat livable wage. And it's just not worth the trade off, especially if I'm willing to work for your minimum wage and not make enough to pay my bills. But all I ask is that you treat me with some respect, that you understand when I'm sick, that you treat me like a human being. And so I do understand why people are doing the things that they're doing, because what, like I was saying, when I was younger, I was just I would was good at picking up jobs. And, uh, you know, I'm sure it had something to do with the fact that I was cute. When you're cute, like more people hire you. That's just what it is. You know, people are more likely to hire you. Studies have been done on it. It's just what it is. But back in those days, if you had a piercing, especially a noticeable piercing, a lot of places wouldn't hire you and they didn't care how cute you were. What It just was considered unprofessional. One job I was at didn't even allow you to dye your hair. If you dyed your hair, you had to buy a wig. And I wore a wig. I wore a wig for sure. It was a hideous wig. It was like a Beatles type wig. But a lot of the guys at my work wore them. Like, because the, there was another rule. If you're a man, if you're male working at the store that I worked for, because that's when I was working for the grocery store, you're because we wore polos and your hairline, your the back of your hairline couldn't drop past the collar of your polo. And so if you had longer hair than that, then guess what? You had to wear a wig. And so there were several us, several of us that wore wigs to work every day. And like I said, these wigs were hideous. Nobody ever thought they were our real hair. People, Friends would come in to make fun of us. It's It was a Latino neighborhood. So, you know, Latinos love to clown on each other. And so you think my friends didn't pop in every once in a while just to see me with that wig on. And since I was on the clock and I was out on the floor, I couldn't just... <laughs> I couldn't just remove my wig. I had to wear my wig. There was finally a point where one of the main managers after the GM, after several months of having to look at all of us, was just like, guys, take the wigs off. Take the wigs off. And I think it's because he knew that if we were really put to it, because my thing was I like to dye my hair when I was younger. I don't mind dyeing it now. I don't always love it because I hate the pro I, literally the process. But I hate sitting there waiting for my hair to get colored. And that's the only problem that I have with it. But I love what Angie Crumb did with my hair. And so I'm going to get it done again. But I'm waiting for as long as I possibly can. But anyway, um, since I liked having different hair colors and stuff, if they really had put it to me, like you either have to dye your hair back to black and just leave it like that permanently or you won't have a job, I would have been like, yeah, then I should probably get out of here and find something else. And I, well, because they were one of my first real jobs, because there was McDonald's as well, you know, before that. McDonald's was, they say McDonald's is a lot of people's first job. That was my first job job was McDonald's. You know, there was other shit when I was a kid. Like there was what they called, um, well, you know, it was a derogatory name for people that crossed the borders, but that's what they used to call it when I was younger. They used to call it back work. And it was me and some of my other young friends that were 15, 14 at the time. I think I was 14 at the time. And because it was work for undocumented people obviously undocumented means undocumented so if we showed up as kids because the way that those worked was it was almost kind of like a home depot situation except for it was a little more organized a little more formal than that but what would happen was you'd all go 
to this particular stop and it was kind of honor system, sort of like an open mic where it's like, you know, this person was here first, this person's here second. Like you all knew where you were in line, basically. And then they'd come and take maybe the first 20 or the first 10, depending on what they needed. And so they would take you literally one time my job was passing chickens. There was one day that I'm glad I missed. And that's when they were tossing watermelons because that's the way they would get the watermelons from like the patch to the truck, I believe was. I wasn't there that day, so I don't know exactly what the process was. They told me about it and they told me it was hard and they told me that it was that was exhausting. And um, that, of course, since the watermelon is supposed to be sold, you can't break too many of them. So you've got to be able to catch that watermelon and they do literally like fling it. That's one thing I remember them telling me is that they had to fling it. And then the other person on the truck, yeah, so from the patch to the truck, um, on the truck has to actually catch the watermelon and then put it in the truck. And so you do that all day. And some of these jobs you would think would run out, but they don't. Like when I pass chickens, I literally pass chickens for an eight-hour day. And what happens is as you're passing the chickens – as the chickens become fewer and fewer, the line gets shorter, but it gets shorter from the back. And I was closer to the front. So we were the last to leave. And we like thankful for the day's work. But we were kids just raising money to get school clothes that our parents wouldn't buy us, you know, because my parents were very much like, yeah, we'll get you a couple cool things or whatever, but we're not just going to break the bank. You know, I had my three sisters when I was growing up. So my parents weren't just going to spend all their money buying me guests was the big brand at the time. They weren't just going to buy me a bunch of guest clothes. We weren't just going to go down to Miller's Outpost and say, put it in the bag. No, it wasn't happening like that. It wasn't a put it in the bag situation. It was like, put that back on the shelf. You're not getting that. And so one of my friends had told me that they were doing that kind of work because their dad, this is the the realty on how we even knew about it. their dad was undocumented and it was something that they carried a bit of shame about. But I was raised in a family where you don't think about that. Like that's not really a thing. You know, every once in a while you get mad at somebody and say some sideways stuff, but that's just cause you're talking sideways to somebody that you're mad at. But really I was raised not to at all judge people on that. Like if people are working, if people are doing their best, even if they're not working, it's not your place. It's not your position to judge people on where they are in life. Like that's literally the way I was raised. So even though my friend carried a lot of shame about it, it came in very handy in that way when he was like, well, you know, we can go work with my dad. That's what I do sometimes to get extra clothing, extra school clothes money. Because, uh, you know, like, obviously, his dad being undocumented, he's not making the most money. Like, I, th I want to say we are making, maybe it was $6 an hour, which wasn't considered terrible at that time, because uh, minimum wage was like three something, I want to say. So it was more than minimum wage, you know, almost double. I think it was 317, 363. It was some weird number. But if you know, shout it out in the comments. If you're still watching, we're, we're, we're in this episode. But yeah, so, you know, we were making $6 an hour. And for kids, that was good. And, you know, we were able to get some school clothes money. But yeah, my point is, I was, I was always going from job to job and a lot of the jobs had so many rules. And so I remember one time I went to a photo developing place. So nobody was even going to see me. I it was literally photo developing. And I had had a good work history at that point. You know, that's when I had just come off the grocery store job. And I looked really good on paper for that kind of worker, you know. And the guy was super excited. He's looking down. He's... uh 
you know, checking out my paperwork, my application. And I had learned way back in the day that when you drop off an application, you actually speak with the manager. And I had, you know, or you ask if you can speak with the manager. And I had done that. And the manager apparently had liked me or thought, you know, I might be a good fit or whatever. So he had passed that along. So I just remember the guy like coming out and he's like looking at my application and he's so excited, you know, and then he looks up and I had just gotten my eyebrow pierced. And this was forever ago when people were first, when that was first becoming popular. Literally in Arizona, I had to be one of the first people that had my eyebrow pierced because I saw it on a music video and I wanted it. And there's a place in Arizona that's famous for piercing. It's called HTC Piercing. That guy is legendary in the piercing world. I can't remember his name, Steve something or other, but they at the time they kind of had a monopoly there were other places you could go to get pierced but htc everybody knew htc was a place you went and i had been to htc before when i had gotten my nose pierced and uh i ended up getting tired of that kind of quick but a lot of people had nose pierced in like late 80s you know when i was a kid there were a lot of people that had that. It wasn't that uncommon. So when I got that done, that one I wasn't at all a pioneer in. A lot of people had it. But when it came to the eyebrow piercing, I just wanted an eyebrow piercing. So I went down to HTC and I was so excited about it. And th this guy is like looking at my application. He looks up, he sees, and I see that's exactly where he looks. He looks right at my eyebrow and he's like, oh, well, you know. We'll give you a call. We'll, we'll see if we end up having anything. Of course, they didn't have anything for me. And then I was like, OK, well, I do need to get a job, so I better take this out. So after paying a ridiculous amount of money back in those days, now you can get your brow pierced for probably 30 bucks, I would imagine. And that's not an exaggeration. You could probably get it for 20 some places. But back then it was like 70 or 80 because not a lot of people were doing it. So they had to make as much money as possible per customer. And they were able to, because like I said, they almost had a monopoly on body modification. And so I had to take it out. And then a lot of people would think that if you're doing sex work, that you can just do whatever you want. And yeah, you technically can. But what was in fashion at that time, like now you could do sex work with as many tattoos or more because the Internet has opened it up like that. But back in those days, a lot of times what they wanted was an innocent boyish, especially with my frame and my age and, you know, all the factors I was hitting. They really wanted a wholesome type boy. And so I couldn't get a bunch of tattoos. I remember at the time I had two tattoos there's two tattoos that i had one is one day i'll do tattoo stories but i think it's best to do them one at a time but there's an onk that i have and then there's also the chinese symbol for love and so or the chinese character for love and so i have those two i had those two tat on tattooed on me from a very young age i want to say i was 17 or possibly 16 my parents had to sign off on the onk tattoo and then the love tattoo i think i was 19 when i got that one done i think and so i've had those tattoos specifically pretty much my entire life and nobody ever asked because it was just assumed that you didn't have tattoos and then also there were at least body pictures in the what's it called in the adult magazines because you didn't want to put your face in the adult magazines because then like now people's faces are everywhere but back then they would try to bust you in stings and so if they could look and be like this is the person from that particular ad it made it even easier for them to spot you out and do some shady stuff and the police were known one day i want prostitution to be fully legal just so that you can protect or we can protect the people that are actually doing sex work you know the hand-to-hand -hand, so to speak sex work and uh, nothing against the online i'm not trying to undercut it is what it is you know when people say sex work is sex work that's something i do believe in you know but there's just different factors for each one you know a person that's online will a lot of times have different concerns than a person that's doing the, you know, street or escort type work, which I was not on the streets. I would, uh, I 
tried the streets one time. I do a story about it on stage. I, literally one night I tried the streets and I was like, not for this bitch. But anyway, um, so like, you know, nobody ever asked before. And then there came a point where I think just tattoos started being more popular at the time. So people would ask and I would literally tell them, yeah, I have two because the onk is probably that big. And the Chinese character is probably smaller than that. Th that you've seen on my Instagram, I'm sure. It's on my hip. When I dip, you dip, we dip. But it is on my hip. And I uh, I remember there were a couple people that asked me, a couple men that asked me on the phone, do you have any tattoos? And I was like, yes, I have two small tattoos. Sorry, I'm not interested. Like So I knew that getting tattooed like I am now or anywhere close, and I'm not even done. You know, I still want to be at least half sleeve on both arm. I think fully sleeved and bam. I think I'll have a full bodice when we're done. But, you know, I... And then a couple more on the face, I do think. Even though, like, I've had people... My niece is not in approval of me getting face tattoos. She's had it with the face tattoos. I'm, she's fine with the ones I have, but she's let me know that this this should not be a thing. And it, it, <laughs> I'm not listening to her either. Fuck that bitch. Just playing. I love you. But, you know, when it comes to my niece, she's not going to tell me what I can and can't do. But I do at least somewhat take her opinions into account because she's my niece and I love her. But I've had for so long... Like I said, I wasn't in control of myself. I couldn't do whatever I wanted to do. And so now when it's getting because I'm not morbid, like I'm not thinking I'm going to die tomorrow or anything like that. But who knows how much longer we have on this earth and with the way things have gone with COVID and with the way things are going with the Ukraine and Russia, just playing that probably won't affect us. But let's throw it in anyway. The way things are going with the Ukraine and Russia, just the state of affairs throughout the world. Antifa is running wild out there. Who knows? Antifa could come busting in my place right now. I'm a fascist. I supported Donald Trump. I was part responsible for the January 6th insurrection. If you listen to the news, tell it. Even though I wasn't anywhere near there and like really, if I had known anybody that was going to go down there, I would have been like, yeah, that's probably a stupid idea. I wouldn't recommend that because if there's one thing I'm not about, it's about going to get in trouble. I will stay my ass at home. I've been a few free breathing rallies back in the day, back when I was a gal just playing. That was <laughs> maybe a year ago I was at some of the free breathing, but if with the free breathing, if you know anything about those rallies here in Vegas specifically and Trump rallies also here in Vegas specifically, they were sanctioned by the police in a lot of cases. The police couldn't outright come out and say it, but they were very nice to us and they would just tell us, look, these are the things that you guys need to do so we don't have to arrest anybody. We don't want to arrest anybody. And, you know, some people would say that that's unfair, that the but a lot of police in more liberal places like Portland and Seattle are the same with Antifa and Black Lives Matter. You know, they'll let them get away with certain things because they believe in the cause or think that they're on the side of right. And this in Vegas just happens to be the opposite where they lean a little more right. And they're like, OK, well, these are the things that you guys need to do so that we don't have to arrest you. And so, you know, I like I was saying, I'm just big on not getting in trouble or not putting yourself in a position to get in trouble. That's why, you know, with some of the stuff where people have tried to, like, start fights with me and stuff like that, it's like. Yeah, I don't think you get it. I'm just built to not get in trouble at this point. When I was younger, trouble all the time. Just didn't give a fuck. I got it. It was it was my motto when I was younger. I don't care. But now I'm just like, yeah, I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to spend a day away from my dog. It's part of the reason I don't even want to be on the road right now is because I love being with my Snoopy Doopy, and I can't take her everywhere with me. She just turned around. She winked at me. She gave me a, she flirting. But, you know, she, that's part of the, like, it's, you know, I like being at home, and I like doing the stuff that I have to do, and so I don't want to get in any unnecessary trouble or skirmishes or who wants to fight anyway at this age like sometimes people talk like that and they're not even being aggressive towards me they're just in some cases friends of mine like you know 
Anytime somebody threatens me or does anything stupid, there's at least two down ass friends here in Las Vegas that'll hit me up and be like, just say the word, I'll go fuck them up. <laughs> and I was like, don't get in trouble. It's not worth getting in trouble for you or for me. I I get it. Yeah, on some level, that might feel good to some people to be able to call one of your friends and be like, hey, whoop this motherfucker's ass and have them actually do it. Because the people that I talk to are that type. Like, they're not just saying it to be badass. Like, one of them lets me know every time he sees me. And in a lot of cases, you'll see me hanging out with them just because we're friends and have been for a long time just from the comedy scene but he's always very clear with me he's like you know if anybody fucks with you even right now you just tell me and i'll go make sure that i take care of that for you that's not something you should deal with but you know um that's not what i want for them and that's not what i want for me and so i just feel like you know i would rather mind my business and do the stuff that i have to do and like i said just continue to work on content i said at the beginning of the year of what would have been you know around christmas time for everybody else i said i'm going to start my resolutions early and i got to work on that and then i said i'm going to ramp it up by the time we get to my birthday and i've done exactly that and like I said, that's the reason that I'm recording right now. I could have used the excuse that I'm tired or I just want to go to sleep. And I do want to go to sleep. And I am tired because I got a tattoo done this morning and I had to wake up at 11 after having that ridiculous day that I had yesterday where I was just working, working, working. And I didn't end up going to sleep till seven in the morning, I think. So or maybe it was 730. So I slept from 730 until 11 a.m. Then I had to wake up and go get traumatized by getting a tattoo, which I know it's just a tattoo, but it does traumatize your skin. It does actually, you get traumatized if you know anything about the way tattoos work. Like at first, they're just whatever. But you know, when you approach hour three or four, and that this is one of those tattoos, and I'll show it eventually. I just don't want to yet because it's not healed, and I'd rather show a finished, and you'll see it on the stories or whatever at some point. But it's, it's a sizable tattoo so it took like three or four hours for it to get done and so that's a lot of sitting there and a lot of like it wasn't too bad though like gritting your teeth it wasn't until the last probably hour it's always like the last hour half hour that you really get like wow this is but I'm not going to tell them to stop and it's not because I'm a badass but it's because I'm like, no, make this tattoo as sick as it could possibly be. Let's get this all done in one session so I can get out of here and then know who I'm working with on the next one. Even though I still will go to my guy in El Paso. It's just I've had to go to people in Vegas recently because I wanted tattoo work done and I'm not going to make it to El Paso anytime soon. Uh, I probably will work there before the year's out, but you know, and I'll get something done there then. Maybe that's where I'll get this one, the sleeve or the half sleeve filled in. Who knows? Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I've made it through my entire episode the way that I wanted to, and I'm very proud of myself. Now I just have to edit this, which is going to be minimal ep upload. Well, I'm going to edit that out, which is going to be minimal editing and then upload it and get it ready for tomorrow at 3.30 p.m. and... Stay unbothered. <laughs>